Uh, hello, it is March 18th, about 7.30 p.m., uh, filming again from my living room here in New Jersey, uh, night three of COVID-19 uh, video, and uh, definitely um, each day, as I said yesterday, gaining a lot more knowledge and information coming in from all over the world and colleagues, lots of support, um, guidelines, updates on treatment, a little bit of an update on testing. I plan to talk more about testing, but there isn't too much to say there, um, except that uh, we are apparently using a newer lab that can turn around the test in 24 to 48 hours, um, which is a good thing because if we can find out if patients are negative sooner than later, we can stop unnecessary medications. Um, we did start vitamin C today and didn't make it an official protocol, but I uh, do plan on starting it on all patients, uh, at least that I'm seeing in the ICU uh, this week, and spoke with my infectious disease colleagues, and they too will consider it in, uh, in floor patients that didn't go to the ICU that are less sick, as the harm is low. The uh, Chinese in Shanghai government had recommended, at one point, uh, they had used up to 24,000 milligrams twice a day, which is a huge, huge dose. And even though vitamin C is uh, pretty much peed out and uh, little risk kidney stones possibly, um, nonetheless, that is a very high dose. And we couldn't find uh, my clinical pharmacist, uh, uh, nor I or the team, uh, any articles that supported that type of dosing, um, even when used for other common colds and other things, why that dose would be uh, more beneficial than using less. Uh, so they were then uh, dumbing it down to about 12,000 milligrams twice a day IV, and we decided to go with 6,000 milligrams of vitamin C Q12 hours, uh, our own uh, dosing uh, regimen, uh, sort of made up uh, from the higher end of what the Chinese were doing or doing now, and what we were briefly or sometimes using for septic shock, not related to corona prior to corona, uh, at about 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C every six hours in somebody in severe sepsis, um, that was a consideration. So uh, basically using twice that 24-hour dose or 6,000 milligrams twice a day. And uh, I, I think, um, at least anecdotally, we may be, may be getting a benefit from it. Uh, additionally, we uh, did apply for compassionate use for the one uh, patient on a ventilator. Um, and uh, although we hadn't received that medication uh, from Gilead yet. Uh, we were hopeful that we were going to get it uh, by this evening and did give uh, two doses of in, uh, anti-interleukin-6 to that patient uh, and also a dose of uh, anti-interleukin-6 to a non-intubated patient with COVID-19 positive. So now two official positive COVID-19s in the ICU and several others out on the regular floors. Um, Remdesivir uh, is the compassionate use medicine I'm referring to, and uh, you can only get it uh, uh, in the United States or around the world uh, for compassionate use. And if you're on a mechanical ventilator uh, and it can prove that the test was positive by PCR. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about tonight was, you know, patients with allergies and how to determine uh, if you have uh, allergies versus um, uh, the COVID-19 and those symptoms can be similar. Uh, some statistics that we got today on a protocol from, from our hospital system, uh, and this is statistics that were compiled from the Chinese data uh, on almost uh, uh, 1,100 hospitalized patients. Um, in fact, they were quite sick, and, and again, we think that um, obviously this, the uh, mortality rates are dropping, um, and the morbidity is dropping uh, somewhat because of all of the information that we received from those who went first, if you will. But 15.7% uh, went to the intensive care unit, and of that 15.7%, 61 61% had passed away by day number 28. Um, I was looking at statistics around the world, and it seems that Germany had the lowest death rate uh, somewhere around, I think, 28 deaths only out of over 10,000 patients diagnosed. Uh, fever uh, was a common presenting uh, sign or symptom. 44% uh, presented with it, but up to 89% had developed it during their hospital stay. And cough, uh, depending on the hospital, again, in, in China, 
uh, 46 up to 82 percent had presented with cough and in, in the one patient that didn't go on the ventilator I am seeing now as he's about a week out uh, from the beginning of symptoms that uh, he does have this cough it's sort of a wet cough um, and he's you know very weak so he's having trouble clearing it um, although it does seem to be uh, happy to report improving at this point clinically speaking um, myalgias, you know, uh, aches, fever, uh, fatigue rather, up to 52%, so about 11 to 52% on in that regards. A shortness of breath or dyspnea, uh, up to 31% had presented with that. And then those uh, went on to develop acute respiratory distress syndrome was between 17 and 29%. Overall, uh, 20 to 30% of the hospitals did uh, have patients that required transfer or admission to the ICU for some sort of respiratory support. So when you look at those symptoms, you know, uh, a lot of those, most of those do not occur with allergies, although uh, patients with severe allergies um, uh, definitely will uh, have cough at times. Uh, even myalgias and fatigue, uh, shortness of breath can, can ensue. Uh, certainly not acute respiratory distress syndrome. And fever would not be uh, typical, at least in, in somebody just with allergies, uh, although I guess low-grade temperatures, if they were severe, may be reported. Um, so the runny nose is, is one of the symptoms that wasn't mentioned that is uh, listed online and all over uh, that you, know, you can get a runny nose. And I think that one particularly uh, is really hard to tell. If you have chronic allergies, you kind of know uh, how you feel around what time of year you can follow the uh, pollen counts, which did boost up recently. So again, you know, looking for other things like uh, sort of that cough or, 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 or fevers or myalgias or certainly uh, exposure at this point. Um, so it is hard to tell and it's better to be safe than sorry. So if the symptoms persist or are not controlled by your typical allergy medicine, uh, your antihistamines, et cetera, then it would be worth um, uh, getting that looked into further. Um, but some patients are asymptomatic completely, and uh, then it becomes even more difficult sometimes. Um, so, so that's that's really a, a brief blip on allergies and COVID nineteen, and uh, the updates on vitamin C and some of the treatment stuff. Uh, one other thing I'd like to discuss uh, briefly tonight is the concept of protecting the healthcare provider, and again, we work with the the best team uh, out there. I've, I've worked with you know, over a dozen hospitals in my training and career, and, and, and we are working with elite and the best, and so they should be protected um, uh, as such. And, you know, the World Health Organization states that this can be airborne, uh, and may, we don't know. We don't know how long it stays airborne, which is why it bothers me to see still parking lots at uh, supermarkets full, and, and yet these people are conjugating and not all wearing N95 masks, which... 95 and you know um, implies that it protects you from 95 percent of those particulate or uh, droplet that that could go through so you're still prone to some of it uh, and that's why when you're going to a level three type of situation where you're, you really have to be protected if you're doing procedures um, you know our, our, our fellow was uh, intubating somebody today and you know certainly um, did have an n95 in the gown and, and the protective eyewear on but there were, you know, at one point five healthcare providers in there, and that, you know, um, you know, really in procedures like that, according to what we're seeing from other countries and even guidelines, a level three is appropriate and and really should be available because um, you don't know how long you're going to be in there, and if this stuff is staying airborne in N95, even in that situation, endoscopies, bronchoscopies, intubations should uh, really have available full respirator, uh, full face respirator masks, and that is. That is in the literature now, in the guidelines, uh, at least recommendations, I should say. Uh, uh, so an N95 is, uh, you know, what's recommended if you're going in and out of a uh, rule in and ruled out, uh, uh, ruling out COVID patients. Um, until you know 100% they don't have it, it really should be an N95 mask. And one starts to wonder if we should be wearing N95 style masks even around the hospital, given uh, the fact that nobody can tell us for sure how long the virus lives on surfaces. We know on, you know, steel and metals, probably about two hours and plastic and cardboard longer than that. Uh, but how long in the air? I mean, is it 30 seconds? Is it a minute? Is it 10 minutes? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, so therefore, uh, I, there's a lot of angst 
right now with healthcare providers, and rightfully so, as they deserve to be protected the best they can. And uh, uh, really, um, all hospitals and uh, and healthcare uh, practices need to be able to provide that level one for triage areas, level two for going in and out of COVID rooms or rule out COVID rooms, and level three if you're doing those procedures. So I did want to bring that up because I think it's important. Um, and I think we'll end it there. Uh, I did forget to mention uh, Kalitra, which is the HIV medicine we're getting some uh, questions on. Uh, however, uh, really it's supposed to be an alternative if you can't get hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil or chloroquine and um, or uh, uh, stelmavir, uh, which is again the compassionate uh, use medication, if you will. So I think, um, I'm sorry, it's remdesivir. Uh, so I think that's really it. So we haven't used uh, uh, the HIV medications at this point in time. Uh, but uh, we'll consider it. Uh, speaking to uh, ID colleagues, it, it causes severe uh, GI upset in cases, and most patients that had to take it for prophylaxis if they had a needle sticker, pretty miserable um, uh, with uh, you know diarrhea and, and GI upset. So sometimes that you know if we don't have good evidence or even some evidence uh, that we're getting reports from of significance. Uh, we're going with these other agents first, so that will conclude on the treatment segment. Um, thank you for all the support uh, uh, from all the colleagues and people out there, uh, text message after text message, and lots of thanks to the healthcare providers and the teams that we're working with. Uh, we're all in this together. We're all working together. And be safe. Have a great night. And tomorrow uh, we will uh, certainly have more updates and things uh, to discuss. I'm um, day three out of seven into my ICU journey uh, against COVID. Uh, was in two rooms uh, today, uh, uh, heavily protected. Um, again, with a level two N95, but um, uh, fortunately, I didn't have to do any procedures because uh, at this point, I would um, I would uh, definitely want to have at least available the full full face, uh, almost respirator style masks, filters. Okay, have a great night. Thank you.